All righty. Um, so before, before I kick this off, just, just to get a gauge of the room, who, who, who read the Remnant article that I wrote a little while back? Just how many people? Okay, all right. I just want to see how many people I'm going to offend um, before I get started here. So has anyone actually, so who follows me on Twitter? Slightly larger. Okay, cool. All right, so the rest of you are in for a treat. Um, where's, where's the clicker? Um, I, I'm kind of generally known for either controversial opinions or unpopular opinions, and that's going to be the basis of this talk. I didn't have enough time to actually prep anything other than a quick slide presentation this morning. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to go through and talk as I see my own slides. So um, the talk was supposed to be called uh, Building for the Remnant, but I forgot. So when I put this together, it clearly says mass adoption. But, that, but that's, the core of the, that's the core of the topic. So really, my, my premise is going to be discussing why, and, and I'm going to try and weave a little bit of Fode's talk, um, or at least some elements of it, um, and try and like challenge maybe a bit of the thinking around this, this idea of mass adoption that gets thrown around everywhere. I fucking hate that word. Um, and I'm going to start it out with this meme. Like Everyone's seen the midwit meme, right? And the idea that Bitcoin, particularly at this point in time, is really only understood or grasped by you know, the, the, the kind of the extremes of the bell curve in terms of, you know, whether intelligence or people's position in, in the world, etc. And I don't know, th this is always my favorite meme. And I've seen it in multiple ways. You know, people who are like trying to trade and shit are always in the middle. And, you know, the guys DCAing are kind of out on the extremes. So if we start with this premise here is I, my contention is that mass adoption is never the goal for anything transformative. Um, the masses, uh, or the herd, which is generally what the masses are, so it's like the 80-20, uh, they come last. They don't set the trend, they follow it. They're the laggards, they either have no idea what they want, um, or they simply default to what's available. Um, this, this is a slightly watered down version of what I said in the article. But the example I always like to use, and I'm going to show a few examples during the talk. Uh, number one is uh, Henry Ford, right? So when he developed the car, everyone I'm sure is familiar with the saying, is like if I had asked people what they wanted, uh, they would have said faster horses. So re reinventing something or creating something new fundamentally requires that you don't build it for everyone uh, in the beginning. And if there's one takeaway that I want people to have from this discussion today is that when we're thinking about Bitcoin, we want to really avoid making it like that which came before. It needs to remain incompatible with the existing system. It needs to be different. It needs to be built unlike what has come before, much like what Henry Ford mentioned there. Here's some faces that you may or may not find familiar. So you've got Galileo, Einstein, Newton, Tesla, Jobs, and Ford, is this idea of like, thinking different. Each one of these guys did not build or did not create or did not think in terms of what the mass ideology was at the time. They created something fundamentally different. And it, if anyone's ever heard of uh, Peter Thiel and his book Zero to One, it's that kind of thinking. It's like that which is new needs to be fundamentally different to that which came before. It's not a one to end innovation. It's not an adjustment. It's not an evolution or... or a transformation of something existing. It's something fundamentally new. And that's what all of these people, all great transformation in history has come from thinking differently and building for selective adoption instead of mass adoption. Um, even, you know, our holy father himself, Satoshi, uh, kind of had this attitude, which is if you don't believe it, be believe me or don't get it, shut the fuck up. Um, I don't have time to convince you. So, so that's kind of selective adoption in, in, in my mind. That's how I think about it. And to, to do a bit of a contrast here, I'm going to show you what I think mass adoption looks like, um, and we're going to do it through some memes. So first of all, babies are dying, right? So anyone remember Roger Ver? Yep, you know, I don't know if he's fucking in a mental institution yet or where he is. But his whole thing, like he wanted to change Bitcoin for what? For mass adoption. Like if we don't increase the block size, if we don't compromise the values of Bitcoin, this is his message, we will not get mass adoption. So under the guise 
of mass adoption, you had this fucking lunatic uh, go from being an actual Bitcoin evangelist to becoming a complete retard um, and turning into what he is today. Um, the next example of mass adoption is um, the fucking scammers, right? So all the shit coiners. Like I, I walked up to the other conference and I was like, I, I need to fucking have a shower afterwards. But you know, these guys also wanted to you know change and adapt and you know shuffle Bitcoin under the siren call of mass adoption. Like if we don't you know do smart contracts with Bitcoin, we'll never have mass adoption. And then you know the the fucking booger eating weirdo in the beginning um, decided to create Ethereum. Um, you know. I don't know what the fuck that is on the guy in the middle, um, Charles. And then you've got people like Raoul Powell who, you know, under the guise of mass adoption will want to shill all the suckers' um, shit coins. So, so th this is another example of mass adoption, which, again, to me, just screams scammer. This is another one. Uh, I call it lipstick on a pig, which is all the existing fintech companies who think that they're, oh, you know, we're, we're pro-Bitcoin, right? Um, who's, wasn't it like... Um, Bellagio or some shit, they created that Nakamoto, we, we are pro Bitcoin or whatever, and then they got fucking ripped on Twitter. But basically, Coinbase, Robinhood, PayPal, th these companies are basically what mass adoption looks like. And when they start to implement Bitcoin, people like start to you know, rave about, oh, it's so cool that PayPal is giving, it's like, no, it's not. It's pretty fucking shit, actually, because it's got nothing to do with what Bitcoin represents. So this is another example of mass adoption, which is, again, in my mind at least, not what the fuck I want. Like, I, 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 who here also hates PayPal? Like, is there anyone else? Yeah. Woo! Okay, good. Thank you. I fucking hate those guys, man. Like, I, even me, like, as a quote unquote Australian refugee, um, I, you know, still have dramas with these retards, like, just for normal payments. And, like, I couldn't imagine what people, like, from, you know, other countries have. And Australia's supposed to be, you know, a good country for PayPal. So, this is kind of, when I think about our options, we've got, you know, on the left-hand side, I don't know, on the one side, freedom, citadels, this idea of sovereignty, localism, capitalism, family, and all this sort of stuff, it, it is a fringe idea that, like, this room is, what, I don't know, 100 people, and this conference is 700 people, you know, we, we, we are the, the quote-unquote the remnant or we are the we are the people who are actually adopting Bitcoin and we're the we're the ones who are going to change the game and set the standard because if we don't set the standard and this is my contention about the masses is that they will default to whatever is available and the alternative to us and the alternative to Bitcoin and the alternative to reinventing not just money Sorry, not just payments and banking and all that shit, but actually reinventing money, the most important fucking technology that exists for any form of civilization, any form of intelligent civilization. The alternative is this shit, right? So, like, this is what mass adoption could very well look like if we don't build something fundamentally different and incompatible with the fucking shit show that we've got on the planet today. You know, you'll have own nothing, have no privacy, you know, you want to go to the bathroom and take a shit and there'll be a camera in there watching in case, you know, you'd shit too much and, you know, they'll, they'll cut your little UBI score down. So th this is sort of one example of the problem. And we know, like, today, what the, what the fiat system gives us. You know, I call it the great lie. You get stagnation, corruption, theft, waste, poverty, blah, 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 blah. All, all these things that we don't want anymore. In order to, like, has anyone ever heard of the saying, uh, you cannot, oh shit, I'm going to really butcher this, but you, you can't solve uh, problems with the thinking that caused the problems in the first place, right? It's, it's, it's an Einsteinian quote. Go look it up if you don't believe me. But basically, all of the problems that exist today are because of the current status quo, because of the model and the frame and the, the existing infrastructure that we have today. We can't go and try and make Bitcoin fit into that. We can't do the Roger Ver thing, the shitcoiner thing, or the lipstick on a pig thing, you know, the, the quote-unquote fintech, because all we're going to do is we're going to perpetuate this lie and probably make it even worse. So, with Bitcoin, we want to fundamentally transform our relationship with time, with energy, with, re with natural resources. We want to root, for the first time in history, like this metaphysical concept and idea of money into physical reality. And if we do that... You know, 
you not only fix the money, like the way we fix the world, I always thought this was missing a line, which is you fix the individual. Like you fix the, the, the individual's relationship with time, with the problem of intersubjective value, and then that downstream starts to fix the world. And that is fundamentally a different direction to mass adoption. I honestly think that that requires focusing on building new primitives and getting the 20% of people that matter, that count, to set the new trend. Um, now there's some good news, there's some good news. This doesn't mean, so a lot of people misunderstand me when I talk about selective adoption over mass adoption. They're like, oh, so you think, oh, only, you know, this many people are going to use Bitcoin. And it's like, no, 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 no. We need to focus on that first. That's the tip of the spear. The masses come later. Like, remember, you, you've got this initiating force, which sets the standard, and the masses are like inertia. It's like a, as bad as this is going to sound, it's like the dumb blind, deaf force, right? Like it just goes in a direction, but it follows the initiating force. So it will happen downstream to selective adoption if we rebuild the standard and if we do it appropriately. And it will only occur if Bitcoin is superior, not just another flavor of what exists today. That, that is not the kind of adoption we want. So the masses will always follow. It's up to us, the 20%, um, which, to be honest, I think Bitcoin is like the 20% of the 20% of the 20%. So it's like a, there's like a fractal relationship there. And I, I kind of spoke about that on a Twitter spaces where I said you've got the remnant versus the masses. And then in the remnant, you've got kind of like the, the active remnant, which is the 20%. And then you've got the dormant. And then you've got kind of like the radical remnant, which is the 20% of the active. And that's probably what constitutes the Bitcoin type of persona or the archetype of the Bitcoiner, which is someone who really is courageous enough and a leader enough to think differently about how the world should look, feel, behave, and function, and that is willing to put themselves out there and do something different, to be the Newton or the Tesla or the Galileo, not to be the fucking Mark Zuckerberg who's, you know, turning Facebook into fucking metaverse. So we can't just be better. I honestly think we must also be fundamentally different and incompatible with the old, which I've bashed on about already now. So to give you guys, like, this is from an old article I wrote like years ago. Um, maybe it wasn't years ago. It feels like years ago because it was near the beginning of the lockdowns. It was called Bitcoin and Lockdowns. And it was just the framework for thinking about how adoption will happen in the world. And the idea is that... Do I have a pointer? No, I don't. Okay. Um, is that B Bitcoin's adoption won't so much be a function of like, you know, we won't be able to think about time or price or any of that sort of stuff. It's going to be more on the spectrum of uh, luxury to necessity. And the, the day that everybody on the world is using Bitcoin is sort of post the day that enough people have died of starvation where they didn't have an option but Bitcoin. And as harsh as that may sound, it's really the, the need to have Bitcoin will be what really pushes people onto it. Most people are not going to come into Bitcoin because of curiosity, like many of us are here. People will come to it because they don't have a choice. Their only other option will be, hey, they've got an opinion, but they've got a fucking slave coin, whether it was issued by Lord Vitalik, Hoskinson, or fucking Klaus, doesn't matter. Um, their money, the product of their labor, the rules around how they use it will be dictated by some sort of central authority. So literally, the, 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 the option down the track in the future for people when it comes to money, when it comes to using the product of the labor will be freedom coin, which is Bitcoin, or slave coin, which is all government issued coins or any shit coin, any, any crypto, for example. And when that reality starts to manifest, and it's already starting to manifest, what you'll have is the crack up boom or that middle phase where, where we start to transition very quickly from Bitcoin being a luxury, for, from it being something that people want to something that people need in order to survive, in order to have some level of freedom. And that's where we start to see the S-curve. Like, a lot of people think Bitcoin's been in a bull market. You ain't fucking seen nothing yet. Like, the Bitcoin bull market starts when one sat equals one cent. Um, and just to get, you know, this may or may not blow some people's yeah. minds, but I think the, the era of measuring Bitcoin price is coming to an end, maybe in the next few years, whatever that might look like. But when we get to one sat, cent sat parity, basically, and we're starting to measure the price of a sat instead, I guarantee you sometime this decade, most likely, we'll see the price of one sat go from a cent to two cents, to three cents. And that movement will happen in a day. What actually happens in the background is that Bitcoin just moved a million bucks in a day. That'll be the biggest 
green dildo any of you will ever see in your life. I promise you. So, uh, I don't know what else I have in here. Okay, looks like I'm kind of finished. If anyone wants to laugh, I'm actually going to go do a couple more slides. How much time do we have, just out of curiosity? Seven, eight minutes. Okay, so just, just to make people laugh, this is some slides from a previous thing. So we just need to, this is just a reminder for who the real enemies are. So the shit coiners, the bankers, the fiat billionaires, you know, the, the health ministers, the politicians, the finance bros. This is sort of like what mass adoption looks like. Um, and, you know, the lemmings as well, like, you know, they, they don't know what the fuck they want, so they're just swimming and drowning themselves with their masks on and shit. So this is what we want to avoid. We need to transform the world, otherwise we're going to have... Oh, and, you know, we obviously want to avoid fucking cartoon character supervillains cosplaying, you know, Dr. Evil. So this is the wrong direction. We want to move in the right direction with Bitcoin. Um, I love this little tweet here. Uh, Francis, a good friend of mine who was supposed to come, but the idiot forgot his passport. Anyway, he, I, this tweet, I just fucking love it. It's like, war is coming deep down, you can feel it. They're coming after Bitcoin next. The last bastion of liberty. The great reset cannot succeed if Bitcoin succeeds. I'm so fucking ready for this. And the crypto guy, oh, we can't win. And then this guy's like, we don't want you. Stay at home, you fucking loser. So that's like... I just, hopefully, through this talk, I've just reminded people, like, we're here for something so much more than just building the next fintech thing, for, you know, making some money with some retard VCs and just, you know, getting mass adoption, like, losers, right? We're actually here to transform the world in a very meaningful way. And, and, and that, like, if I, if I had to say what's missing from the world today more than anything else is actually a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. Like, people are fucking got no idea what's going on anymore. Um, you know, there, there's like rampant depression, rampant stupidity, rampant consumerism, rampant mindlessness all over the place because people have lost a tether or, an, you know, any sort of, I don't know, raison d'etre, like reason for existence. And, and that, that, I think, Bitcoin gives us that. Thank you. Um, I think Bitcoin gives us that because we have something to, to fight for, but then long term, because it tethers human action and behavior to reality, I think fundamentally it allows us to, I don't know, I, I think this is really the, Bitcoin is the most important thing that's probably happened for humanity since maybe the discovery of fire and you know, we had the evolution of the prefrontal cortex. There's nothing more important because it genuinely ties our actions to reality. So yeah, that's me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, we have a couple. We have him for a couple more minutes. I want to uh, make sure anyone that has a question for him on his thesis. Yes, sir. Right here. Yes. Um, from your point of view, uh, what you have explaining right now, what do you think about uh, the, well the way that is implemented uh, the law here in El Salvador to accept Bitcoin as a legal tender? Do you think that is the right way to? Um, do the massification process. Um, what do you? Th what, what will be? Well, the pros and cons on that, from your point of view, and what would you think will happen next in in, in other countries? Will you think that is something that will uh, be re replicated, or can you give me your point of view on that? Yeah, this this is a this is a hard one. So, I don't think there's any right way of a quote unquote country to implement Bitcoin. Like, any, any, any attempt is going to be a clusterfuck, um, no matter what they do, because, again, Bitcoin's just incompatible. Like, a, a country, part of what makes a country sovereign is the right to either issue currency or to mandate who issues currency. So, so Bitcoin is kind of incompatible, but because of the way the power structures function at the moment, you know, and with people sort of being under the thumb of the US dollar, like, sovereigns are trying to think of ways to... I don't know, have a plan B or have an alternate option. So, so what Bitcoin's representing, and, and this is my guess, I, I don't know, and I don't know if I'm going to step on someone's fucking foot here, but whatever. Um, I don't think that a government will want to introduce Bitcoin for the love of its people. Um, I think a Bitcoin will want to do it for some sort of uh, geopolitical advantage or geopolitical optionality for itself, more than that. So coming back to the Bitcoin law, I think 
I mean, it's not perfect. Like, I mean, I, you know, I know there was a bunch of Bitcoiners saying, oh, you know, he shouldn't mandate it, you know, but I mean, tr there's other governments mandating much fucking worse shit. So I can think of other things worse to mandate than Bitcoin. But, um, you know, it, maybe that could have been adjusted a little bit. But then again, maybe it's a good thing because it's going to kind of put um, the fire up people's butts to kind of try and figure out Bitcoin. And maybe through a trial by fire, unbeknownst to the intentions of a government, the people within the jurisdiction start to empower themselves more. Um, and, and I guess this, this room or this conference is actually an example of, I mean, how many people here use Shivo? Four. Okay. So how many people use another kind of Bitcoin product? There we go. So, so, so I think that is like an example of um, the fact that Bitcoin doesn't recognize borders or governments or any of that sort of stuff. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to infect the entire system anyway. And I mean, if I was a government, I, I would be thinking very similar to probably what Bekele was thinking is like, how can I have a fucking plan B and I want to stack as a government. I think that's going to be their best shot. But long term, th we all know what the beauty of Bitcoin is. It's that like, you know, if, if Bitcoin is reality, everything breaks against reality. So, you know, whatever they think they're going to get, um, it's probably going to evolve and emerge into something very different. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think any movement towards Bitcoin and, you know, doing it in some way, shape or form at the, at the state level is, is a net good, but it's... Um, I don't care too much for it. Maybe, maybe that's is that kind of answer. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Uh, one follow up, quick follow. Yep. Um, do you think it was the right time to do so? I think a bit more education could have gone into it. I think you know there could have been more engagement with the Bitcoin community because, as you see, like, I mean, Bitcoin has come out and they'll fucking. Bitcoiners are like worse than vegans, okay? They'll fucking tell everyone about Bitcoin. I don't, you know, it's like, and they won't shut up about it. So it's like, you know, th that, that's one of the things that um, I, I guess in some way could have been maybe better done is like tell the Bitcoiners about it earlier so they can come in and, you know, do a little pre-training. But whatever, trial by fire, who gives a fuck? I learned how to swim by jumping in the deep end of the pool. So maybe, you know, Bukela is like a brother from another mother. There was one more question out there, which I'll answer quickly. Oh, and then we have the, the lady in the back on the yellow. So, so let's go with this gentleman here. All right. Uh, thanks. Got a quick one. Which debate would you, uh, which current debate would you wish that Bitcoiners would just quit wasting their energy on and let, let go? Mm. Um, are Bitcoiners still debating and arguing about fucking taproot? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I, uh, look... <laughs> I actually like Bitcoiners debating whether it's smart shit or stupid shit or whatever. Like, what, what ends up happening is, w one thing I found in Bitcoin, and particularly Bitcoin Twitter, is that there might be a particular blow up, but then people seem to move on very quickly straight after it. Um, it it's very rare that a particular blow up or a particular debate lasts really long, unless it's something extraordinarily important. So, I don't know. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I, I, I like watching the people fight. I, I, I always imagine the, um, the, the Simpsons meme, you know, where the monkeys are just fucking fighting and they're sort of betting. So let them fight because that, that's how good ideas actually get. That, that's how iron sharpens iron and people will figure it out. Excellent. Thank you. I'm uh, back here. One last yeah. question uh, for Alex. Hi, I'm Maria. I'm an interpreter. Hey, I'm interpreting for you guys. Awesome. I came, I'm, um, <laughs> woo! And Rosma. Hold on, before you ask the question, did you interpret every time I said fuck? I say puta. Okay, mierda. beautiful. I love so it. So, my question is, I Just got here, I, I am a, I'm starting to use uh, Bitcoin. I've been doing it for like three years, still learning in the process. I got called to interpret for this conference. My, my respects to everybody in this, in this crowd and mm -hmm. my respects to everybody coming to my beautiful country. I already live outside of El Salvador, but... For what I have seen, and coming back to El Salvador now after the pandemic, and now that Bitcoin has been launched, right? The biggest issue, and I give you my father, 63 years old, as an example, is that the government here in El Salvador belongs to a right or left political party. And my dad 
even though he kind of understands what Bitcoin is and that we're heading that way because he uses his cell phone in the United States to pay for everything, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He refuses himself to use Bitcoin because this specific government has launched it. Yeah. And to me, and I am not a Bitcoiner, I'm learning. But to me, that is going to be one of the biggest issues from now on. For, because, I mean, how will you get people to like go from, for something, even though they believe it is good, just because they are thinking that it comes from a political perspective. Yeah, and good. thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Well, yeah, th th this, this is a tough one because I, I was actually having this conversation with some people yesterday and the, from, from someone who was quite involved in the, in the Shiva thing initially and then has kind of stepped back from it. And his comment was that in El Salvador, at least, uh, Shivo is Bitcoin, um, and Bitcoin is Shivo. So, so, and and that, that, that's one of the, I guess, the dangers of the, the, the bumbling fools that is the state, right? So, like, th think, think about the state or the government as this. It's like the, the most incompetent people get together and make the most incompetent decisions that affect everybody. Okay, that, that's how you want to think about the government. So, anything they touch, basically, they ruin. So, um, but sometimes they can fuck things up in a positive direction, so which is kind of maybe what's happened here. Um, so unfortunately, one of the negative externalities is that we've got uh, people misunderstanding that Bitcoin is some, you know, fascist government creation to, to come and kill us. Um, but I guess the, the, the only counter to that is that we've got to have all of these crazy people here, in this room, in the next room, and, you know, around, to come in and do our bit to hopefully train and educate people and to, to help them learn. And the thing is, coming back to the remnant idea, so, so there was, the, the, the idea of the remnant comes from the, the book of Isaiah, which the, the concept for me was introduced, well, it was introduced to me by, um, by Francis, and he had read a, an essay by Albert J. Nock called um, the, Jesus fucking Christ, what's the name of it? Can someone help me here? Isaiah's job, that's right, yes, Isaiah's job. And, and one, of the, one of the things that was mentioned in there is God tells Isaiah that uh, you will get up and you will speak to the crowds, the people, but out of every hundred who hear you, and I'm paraphrasing now, only one will listen. The other 99 will continue walking. And, and, and that's our job. It's like we, we can't deviate the message and dilute the signal and turn it into shit coinery and fucking noise because then we're kind of, we're, we're defeating what we came to do in the first place. So it's like, as long as we remain pure, rem like understand why Bitcoin exists and what, what its ramifications and impact on the world are and maintain that sort of purity of message, we will impact those who matter and those guys become sort of nodes themselves and impact those who matter. And we start to actually create a groundswell and that's how the opinion shifts because people always look like as bad as this sounds like there's three types of people in the world there's those who make things happen those who watch things happen and those who wonder what the fuck happened um, and you know hopefully the people in here are the ones who make things happen but the, the ones who sort of even watch things happen they, they sort of want strong leadership and conviction and every single one of you in here is a leader um, and someone who can help rebuild the narrative from a grassroots level, because that's the way narratives really get rebuilt. Like, whenever a narrative comes from the top down, it turns into a shit show. Like, it turns into, let's go Brandon, basically. So, you know, that, that would be my answer. It's like, we, everyone in here, it's like our duty to maintain a, a, a strong signal and not dilute it um, under some banner of mass adoption. So, thank you again, everyone. Appreciate Excellent. It. Thank you, Alex.